The Glorious Revolution occurred in 1688 and brought about the establishment of constitutional monarchy in England. Just to review the Stuart family tree and um, to talk a little bit about their reign, there was the uh, King James I and his son Charles I, who uh, was the king who was executed during the English Civil War, the reign of Cromwell. Charles I was then succeeded at first by his son, Charles II, um, who was our Mary monarch, and then James II, who will be at the heart of the Glorious Revolution. Charles II was restored to the English monarchy in 1660. So this is the restoration of the British monarchy following the English Civil War and kind of the gloomy reign of Cromwell. And so he's King Charles II, the Mary monarch, brings back Christmas, brings back fun. Um, so everyone has a good time during his, uh, during his reign. He got on okay with, uh, the parliament. Um, he was certainly, uh, supported, I would say, by the British people. He comes back to a hero's welcome, etc. But, however, the parliament and other powers that be in England, they were deeply suspicious of his preference for Catholicism, even though he didn't wave the Catholic banner, so to speak, um, and his deep, deep ties to the court of Louis XIV, where he had spent much of his young life and his young adulthood. Uh, the matter of the Glorious Revolution, however, really came to a head with the ascension of Charles's brother, James, his youngest uh, brother. Charles died without a living heir, without a child, and so James took the throne. Now, whereas Charles didn't wave the Catholic banner, so to speak, um, James did, and he was a practicing Catholic. He made no secret about it. And many people in England, and particularly in the gentry class and in the parliament, feared the restart of civil war and religious conflict in the, during the reign of James I because of his religious tendencies. However, there was this idea to say, oh, he's an old man, he won't live long. He did have Protestant children, um, two daughters, that uh, they just had to wait him out. However, uh, he became king in 1685, and he married again um, a French or an Italian, Italian, I think, woman um, Catholic who gave birth to a son. And it was that birth of a little boy who that sparked the crisis in England, this idea of um, a long-lived Catholic monarchy, a Catholic line um, for the English throne that sparked some uh, members of the British gentry class and aristocracy in the parliament to take action out of fear of the resurgence of religious conflict. There just wasn't the stomach in England, I would say, to go back to religious conflict, to go back to the possibility of a Catholic monarchy and a re-Catholicized state. And so upon the birth of this child, which was greeted with great controversy in England, um, members of the English nobility traveled to the Netherlands to meet with a man named William of Orange. And William of Orange was a uh, well-known figure in Europe. He had fought many wars with Louis XIV, in which he wasn't entirely successful, but in some cases was able to hold his own. And he was well regarded as kind of the Protestant leader of England as far as monarchs went. So many of our monarchs were Catholic. Um, he is the Protestant leader of, of England. And the uh, House of Orange, we have looked at them before to say how the Dutch Republic um, uh, resisted absolutism. Well, members of the House of Orange, if the Netherlands were to have had a monarch, it would have been William of Orange, but they didn't want to have a monarch. And so a monarchy was never established in the Netherlands, but uh, William of Orange was certainly, as far as royalty goes, and a prince, he was somebody who was available. He was somebody who was Protestant and potentially had uh, a claim to the throne. So these members of the English nobility, they go to William of Orange 
and they say, William of Orange, would you like to be the King of England? And he says, sure, sounds great to me. I mean, who wouldn't want to be the King of England when you were trying to be the King of something, etc. And he was an enemy of Louis XIV, and um, he saw great potential to kind of enhance his uh, possibilities there um, with his enemy if he was the King of England, etc. And so he said, sure. And the members of the nobility then they said, great, uh, come on over raise an army, invade, we won't resist you. And so he raised an army and he invaded. And um, James and his wife and his son fled to France. And this is the glorious revolution, the invasion of William of Orange, which caught nobody by surprise. True to their uh, word. There was no army to meet or to resist William. Uh, the king fled. He abdicates the throne and flees in fear for his life. And not a drop of blood is shed or nary a drop of blood is shed. Thus the glorious revolution. And William of Orange and his wife Mary become the king and queen of England. We call them William and Mary. You have probably heard of like the university or the college of William and Mary. Um, they become involved in the uh, uh, um, formation of British colonies or whatever, that they become the king and queen of England. Now here is the connection. Those daughters of James, of King James II by his first wife, those Protestant daughters that he had Mary and Anne. Mary is the connection to the throne in the William and Mary. She was the wife of uh, William of Orange, the daughter of James II, and thus a feasible, legitimate heir to the throne of England and preferable to um, the Parliament and the British Society because she was Protestant. Now, this represents, this coming of William and Mary and their taking of the throne represents a remarkable change in British history. And this is certainly a very important moment in the uh, history of, of Europe because it initiates the coming of, a, the formation of, the solidification of a constitutional monarchy. Upon taking the throne, William and Mary were required prior to their coronation to sign a document called the Declaration of Right. And bad quality image here. She is see William and Mary upon the throne. And they have been required in order to become the king and queen, to be coronated, to sign the Declaration of Right. A remarkable document which said that the king rules by the consent of parliament. Think about what that says right there, what that means. The king rules by the consent of parliament. The prevailing theory of monarchy at the time was the divine right theory of monarchy. That the king was ordained by God and therefore answered only to God. Who were the mere mortals, the men, to question what God had ordained as divine right monarchy? This is the opposite of divine right monarchy. The king does not rule by the uh, ordination of God or by the anointing of God, but rather by the consent of parliament. And so the Declaration of Right settles the question of the power of the king and parliament and shifts it decidedly in, in the parliament's favor. William and Mary also signed in 1689. So in 1688, they uh, the Glorious Revolution occurs. They become the king and queen. They take the throne. And in 1689, very importantly, they sign a document called the English Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights was the first such thing to exist in the Western world. And uh, so the English Bill of Rights um, is one of the first documents of its kind in the Western world, and it protected the right of individual Englishmen. Now, in this case, specifically members of the aristocracy, etc., but it protected their individual and personal rights. We talked in class today about it's lunchtime. We talked today in class about John Locke and about his notion of natural rights. And think about how beautifully this fits in with that concept of the purpose of government. Okay. And so the English Bill of Rights is the first document to do this. And so it establishes, for example, due process of law that an individual's property, 
liberty or life could not be taken without the due process of law. And what that means is that they had to be charged with a crime. They had to uh, be given the opportunity for a trial, um, et cetera. It couldn't just be that they fell out of favor with the king or the king said or the queen said, et cetera. It established um, the right of the people to petition the king and to be able to do so without fear to, uh, of uh, without fear of harm. And so, to be able to petition the king is um, this is the forerunner of one of the First Amendment freedoms in the American Bill of Rights, the so the right to uh, to petition for the redress of grievances, to go to the king to ask for something, to ask for something to be changed, to make a complaint, um, et cetera. And so this is uh, an inspiration. The English Bill of Rights certainly inspires the um, uh, American Bill of Rights about 100 years later, and it establishes for the first time this concept of personal freedom. Very, very important idea. And taken together, the English Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Rights establish what we call constitutional monarchy, the opposite, the opposite of absolute monarchy. Um, thanks to Bing Images and the child or grown up or whoever who drew this wonderful image because this completely displays a constitutional monarchy about that the power of the king is limited under law. The king rules with the consent of parliament. The king cannot cannot violate the individual rights of the people. And so this is a huge development in uh, the political history of the West. And as we will see as we get into the Enlightenment, the uh, philosophes of France and of uh, the German states and other places look to constitutional monarchy in England as an example of the way things should be. Now, uh, Parliament wasn't done with the Declaration of Rights or the Bill of Rights in securing their rule, if you will. Uh, looking back on the previous 100 or so years of trouble, they uh, passed two additional acts to avoid such trouble in the future. And perhaps we can say these are a little bit heavy handed and there is uh, there's a justification in saying that. Um, but this was all in the name of solidifying the place of Parliament and avoiding any trouble from the Stuarts. The first of these series of acts were called the Test Acts, and they essentially, and did, not essentially, but what they did was to prohibit a Catholic from um, taking the throne of England, to prohibit Catholics from holding high offices in the government or in the army, etc. And so this eventually leads to um, a bit of an era of you know, persecution, maybe light persecution, but you see here, okay, so uh, test acts prohibiting um, Catholics from holding high offices and especially from taking the throne. This is a shot back at the Stuarts, of course, who were Catholic. And this is when you see, and this had been coming for quite a long time, especially since 1688 and the coming of William of Orange, and it really escalates. When we talked about the Edicts of Fontainebleau, we talked about the movement of Protestants out of France to the uh, New World, to um, England, to the Netherlands. And at this time, there is this movement of Catholics to France, um, all in these latter years of the 1600s and the early 1700s, this movement of Catholics of uh, from Catholics of Catholics from England to France, um, and uh, because of these reasons, because of the Glorious Revolution and the um, Test Acts, etc. In addition, the Parliament passed the Act of Union um, with the cooperation of members of the Scottish aristocracy, but this kind of was not taken all that well in Scotland, but the Act of Union made Scotland part of England. It established the United Kingdom, uh, which we're familiar with today. And I like that the map that you see here kind of emphasizes Scotland because this is what it's about. And this is a way of saying to the surviving Stuarts who were in France, they weren't that far away, you know, don't try to come back. We have made Scotland part of England and you have no legitimate place here. Um, and that uh, was something um, that, well, this is something that has 
that has continued, of course, the United Kingdom has endured, as we know, but the Stuarts did survive in France, and this is important, worth noting. So we have James II, here he is, with his second wife. Um, here's his first wife, and here is William and Mary, so James's daughter, William, James's daughter, Anne, who uh, succeeded William and Mary. They did not have children, but you can see here, after the death of Anne, um, the Hanover dynasty came to power in England over the objections of Charles Edward, the grandson of King James, so his son by his second wife, James Francis Edward, who got married and had a son, James, you can see there, uh, had a son, Charles, um, did try to come back to uh, Scotland and to reclaim his throne. And um, that's called the Jacobite Rebellion. And that's a very interesting story for another day. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending you look at it, unfortunately for him, he failed in his endeavor and constitutional monarchy was maintained in uh, the United Kingdom.